Thank you all for coming uh, again this evening. Uh, Senator, this is the first season of uh, what we call Talk of the Hill. Uh, and we've had some, uh, and this is the final session of this first season. We've had some, I think some, uh, we're off to a good start. We started with Brian Lamb, some of you may remember uh, from C-SPAN, then Charlie Cook here to give us his uh, take on election 2012. Uh, Congressman John Lewis was here, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who live on the Hill, uh, and uh, Secretary uh, Kathleen Sebelius last time, and it's especially fitting that we end the season with uh, a Capitol Hill neighbor resident, Senator Mary Landrieu, who has done more, did more than anybody else to help provide the funding that established this Hill Center. It's without Senator Landrieu, this Hill Center would not be here today. So, Senator, we thank you for taking the So, um, I have to start with the, the, the question that really intrigues me about your state, Senator. How do you pronounce it? Is it Louisiana or Louisiana? I say Louisiana, but you can say it any number of ways, and we will respond uh, <laughs> anyway. But I say Louisiana. Uh, so it doesn't so have to be Louisiana. It doesn't have to be Louisiana. 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 Now I uh, ask, uh, and we should recognize Frank Snelling, my husband. husband here as well. I asked Frank if you hi guys had a chance. Let's start with the news of the day. Everybody's talking about last night's debate and how the president did. I know you had a chance to watch at least part of it. It was on foreign policy. Uh, what was your takeaway from the debate? I thought the president did uh, very well, and of course, as a supporter of his and as a Democrat, I'm very happy to see the president defend what I think is really um, an extraordinary record in many ways, both on the domestic front and the international front. And of course, we um, barely got over that first debate, and uh, <laughs> and we're so excited to see him uh, defend what is really a remarkable record, given what he. Uh, you know, what he inherited coming into office on the domestic front and on the international front. I mean, neither one of these wars were, you know, his making. He wasn't leading when we went into Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, he's, um, you know, killed and eliminated Osama bin Laden, redirected our efforts to the threat, which is Al Qaeda, and has taken out most of the senior leadership and went on to say that, you know, Mitt Romney's proposals to add money um, to over two trillion dollars to the Department of Defense that the Pentagon is not even seeking uh, and claiming that he can balance the budget is truly a hoax and it, it's not, the math doesn't add up. I hope people can see that. It was also interesting, I might say, that he, Mitt Romney seemed to agree with the President on any number <laughs> Um, you know, of issues um, and forgot that Iran has a thousand mile coastline, but other than that, um, you know, so I thought the president did a really good job. But let me say before I go in, Bill, to the questions on the debate, and I got to watch most of it, I really appreciate being here. Nikki and Steve Simarad are neighbors and were some of the first people that befriended us when we came to the Hill and uh, have just really um, welcomed us to this wonderful neighborhood. I often laugh with Nikki and Steve and Bill, of course, you're in the neighborhood too, that I grew up in a neighborhood like this and to a certain extent my husband did as well. We've always lived in the city, you know, within two or three minutes of work, both of us. Um, Frank grew up in a little town in Monroe where his mother would have everyone over for dinner every night. Uh, would never let him in the kitchen, so he has failed to learn to cook. But other than that, she cooked for everyone else. Um, and I grew up in a, on Prier Street in New Orleans, which had a tiny little grocery store called Dorman's Grocery, kind of you know a few blocks away. So I really can appreciate the life that we live on the hill. Of course, I still have a residence in uh, Louisiana, but we've raised our kids here, as you know, Bill, uh, Connor and Mary Shannon. Connor's now 20 and at Tulane, at least last we checked, he was at Tulane going to class, and uh, Mary Shannon is at boarding school right down the road in Virginia in Middleburg, so she's not too far away, and we get to see her often. So I wanna begin by just thanking some wonderful neighbors uh, for being such a special neighborhood, for members of Congress who do choose to spend time here, um, 
And you're going to have to forgive me tonight for being a little partial to the Democratic side, but if I get too much, I can say some good things about the other side well, if, I, if I have to. Uh, you know. That means two of us. <laughs> uh, so. no, it was great having you in the Neighborhood Center, and, and both you and Frank so active uh, in, in the community. I, your your three-minute commute, I just have to say, Carol and I, some of you know, live just down 8th Street uh, near 8th and Independence, and I broadcast on current TV every morning from... Uh, the corner of 7th and, and Pennsylvania uh, atop Le Pan Cotidien there, right, right over Peregrine. So my commute is a three-minute walk uh, yeah. every morning. And, and uh, so You and I are the luckiest people. Absolutely. Yeah. And someone the other day said, now do you have a car pick you up? I said, <laughs> I could throw a stone and hit the office. Well, now, so let's come back to, to, to the politics of the moment. Um, with we're two weeks, two weeks, two weeks from, from tonight. tonight. Tonight we'll be in front of the tube, and uh, hopefully we will polls. know to, yeah. to, to, the the same night as the election. There'll be no recount or anything this time. Uh, but some Democrats are very nervous, Senator, because the latest NBC Wall Street Journal poll showed. Um, no matter you and I both think President Obama has done a great job and brought us back from the deep poll, the poll 4747, a national tracking poll. Should Democrats be nervous? What's your gut tell you? We should be working very hard. I was That's where I was. I'm sorry I was late, but I was in Connecticut with uh, Chris uh, Murphy today and Barbara Mikulski and um, Jean Shaheen. And we did a rally for Chris uh, in Hartford. And um, so that's where I was today, and that's why I was late coming in. Our plane was, for an unexplicable reason, an hour late. There was no bad weather in either place. No mechanical problems, so go figure. But... Um, but you know, I've, and then a couple of days ago, I was out in North Dakota with Heidi Heidkamp, uh, who is really in a neck and neck race, despite the poll that came out, uh, that from sort of a, a new, uh, I, I say bogus, it may not be completely bogus, but it's been discredited, the poll that came out having her 10 points um, you know, behind. So the point is, we want to win the presidential. We also want to hold Democratic majority in the Senate in order to really form the policies that are going to continue to lift us out of this economic um, recession that we're coming out of uh, and to forge a path you know, ahead with so many exciting and challenging places around the world. So I wouldn't say we should be nervous, but I think that we should all be working very hard. And as I shared with a group of 200 women gathered at a fundraiser after the rally that reminded them, you know, that I won my race in 1996 um, by 5,778 votes, but who's counting? Uh, out of, you know, 1.5 million cast, we have 4,000 precincts in Louisiana, so you can do the math, it's 1.23 per precinct. And, you know, I mean, think about that. You know, there are anywhere from 400 to 1,200 people in a precinct, and, um, you know, just one person would stay home and I would have lost that race. And the guy that would have taken the seat in the Senate, which I've proudly held and hopefully have done a good job for not only my constituents, but this community and people around the, the country that I represent to some degree, you know, would have made Jesse Helms look moderate. I mean, the guy that I ran against, it was the leader of way to the right of the family forum, way to the right of the family forum. And you know, it just really is heartbreaking for me to think about someone like that representing the Senate, but the country is very divided philosophically, which is I think what the president is, is feeling out there is this um, great divide. Mm -hmm. um, and while the president did a good job in his first election, I think to reach across, and I think he's tried to reach across this time, but there's not a lot of you know reaching back. Um, and not a lot of credit given to President Obama. I was reading some of the figures that had, um, you know, we were losing 800,000 um, jobs a, a month. month. <laughs> you know, eight, he came into office. We were losing 800,000 jobs. Um, and now in the last 31 months, we've been gaining jobs every, every month for the last 31 months. And yes, it's not where we want it to be. But you know, Bill, what I find so disingenuous, and I get along very well with my Republican colleagues, but what I find so disingenuous is their lack of ability to give any credit to the president for anything. When George Bush was in office, 
I didn't support him on many issues, but when I did, I'll give you an example, like leave no child behind. I know it's been pillared from post to post, but I actually believe schools should be held accountable and federal money that we send should not be given out without accountability. So I went all over the country helping him, standing with him. We were 15 Democrats in the Senate. We're the ones that gave him the majority to pass the accountability. And so since I'm a member that sometimes sides with the other side to do what I think is right, I think I have the right <laughs> to be critical of those that don't. And there's very, very few times where Republicans will come over and they've just made the president's job even harder. And even Mitch McConnell, I mean, I'll just finish with this, stood on the Senate floor. I mean, you can go get the tape and look at it yourself. He said his job, standing on the Senate floor, I don't know if you all were tuned in that morning, he said it more than once, so you can easily get it, um, said that his job was to stop the president and to make sure that he was a one-term president. That's what his job was. Harry Reid never said that about you know, George Bush. We just said when he's right, we'll be with him, or when we think he's right, we'll help him, and not, we'll try to steer our way. So it shouldn't be this close, but it is. I don't think we should nervous, but I think we have to work really hard and make sure we get every vote in. Like I said, I won by, you know, just a few thousand votes. And I think the election is going to be that close where we're going to see just a few thousand votes in one or two states. And then overall, it's going to be close. Well, let, let me follow through on that. And those of you who've been here know uh, our conversation will go for half an hour or so, and then you are welcome to join. So think of your questions and hold them for Senator Landrieu. L let me follow through on what you said about Mitch McConnell, because it's clear John Boehner has had the same attitude in the House. And there have been several issues where the President has gone before the Congress and the Republican leadership with the same legislation that they once supported yeah. under George W. Bush. But they now oppose it because uh, if it's it passed, by President Obama. if it passed, President Obama might get yeah. some might get some credit. Most notably, immigration reform. I mean, uh, he's President Obama was criticized for not passing comprehensive immigration reform. He put forth the same plan George Bush did. They, and John, John McCain, McCain. And then they switched and said, uh, no, even though it was their plan, they can't be for it anymore. Be. So uh, the question I get a lot, Senator, and I don't know the answer, so I'm going to throw it to you is. Not if, but when President Obama is reelected, mm -hmm. will the Republicans be be more willing to work together with him to get some things done? Not to get everything that they want, and not for him to get everything he wants, but just but to something. solve some problem. Do you I, think I that'll hope change? So. I hope so, Bill. But I'll tell you, I think part of the problem, if you excuse me, because you're a member of the press, but you know, but part of the press, <laughs> when they write stories, it's like he said, she said all the time, or the Democrats say, the Republicans say, and I try to help or say to my press people that cover me in Louisiana, you know, your job is, I mean, if you're really a good journalist, your job is to try to find the facts and tell the truth Amen. to the best of your Amen. knowledge and not just report on who said what. I mean, you know, we can find out who said what. You can go on the internet or Google it and find out who said what. But a journalist is supposed to add value because we and most people don't have time, Bill, to sit around and, yeah. and study the issues and look at the reports and actually read the details. I mean, I do it because it's my job. You do it because you're a good journalist. So until the press starts really holding the Republicans' feet to the fire and said, no, it's not just Congress obstructing. Right. It's not Congress that, that's broken. It's the Republican Tea Party, basically, that's got their party wrapped up in circles. It's really the right wing, not every Republican, but it's the sort of Tea Party Republicans that believe compromise is a dirty word. Think about that. I mean, that is just mindless rhetoric because you've got to compromise in everything in this country to get something done. I mean, principle. So I think the press has to, and I think Democrats, I think we have to do a better job of calling that out when it happens. And even if it's uh, having to exaggerate, you know, I can't remember the number of filibusters, but if you can, would you please say it? Because this is startling. Like from the beginning of the history of the Senate, We've had like X number of filibusters, and in the last eight years, I don't know the number, I don't know if you know the number, but it's, I don't know, 50 times more or 100 times more. If somebody could, you know, Google that, Aaron, pretty quickly, my staff's here. But, but that's Mitch McConnell, and that's their their strategy, just to block everything, so it gives the public the idea that 
everything's broken, nobody can work together, and that is really not correct. We know how, how to do this, we can work our way out of it, but the leadership, um, Mitch McConnell's just got to have a change of heart, so if the people of Kentucky don't hold him to it, maybe the press can. And, uh, no, I think uh, the media, and one of the, uh, there's a great book out, and for next season, uh, I hope, hope to get him here, Norm Ornstein, who knows Congress better than anybody good. else, I think, has written a book called It's Worse Than It Looks. Uh, and uh, he lays it out about how bad the gridlock is today and how bad, and, and the abuse of the filibuster. And the abuse of the filibuster and, by the Republicans. By the Republicans. And he says uh, that the media is not doing its job by painting it as just congressional gridlock. He says the fault lies with the Republican Party. It's not the Democrats. The Democrats are willing to work together. And, and Norm is with the American Enterprise Institute. He's not with the Center for American Progress, right? Or, right. He's a he's a progressive talk radio. I mean, an intermediary and uh, he really is. He's a very objective, yeah. independent analyst. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of his co-author, but Thomas Mann. Thank Tom you. Mann, right. Yeah. Yeah. We want to get the, get them here uh, next season and have them because that's a very powerful message, and they they have laid it out there. So one of the big issues where the first test, I guess, Senator, uh, it will if if there's going to be any cooperation across the aisle is the fiscal cliff, we're calling it. So, um, we know pending January 1, one point trillion dollars in cuts, the so-called sequestration across the board, half of it defense, half of it social programs, uh, unless something is done. Does, will this happen and does it have to happen? Is there any way out of it? What do you think is gonna happen? Well, first of all, I agree with you. President Obama will win, so I don't think it will happen because I think that there's a, a, poss a real possibility that when President Obama wins again, although I think it will be a close victory, that there's been enough groundwork done that members of both parties will think it's time to do what we need to do, which is to allow the Bush tax uh, cuts to expire except for those under 250,000 and then basically take the Bull Simpson plan or some version of it uh, we have to cut or we have to find I shouldn't say cut we have to find about four trillion dollars um, over the next 10 years to get our debt in line with our gross domestic product and if you wanted to be a part of the European Union, when all the countries lined up to become a part of the European Union, there were a standard of fiscal responsibility that you have to meet. I'm sorry to say to you all, the United States does not meet that standard today. So if we wanted to be part of the European Union, which we don't, but if we did, we would not be accepted because our deficits are too high and our debt's too high. So there's no, you know, complete, uh, Lee, there's no one way to describe what that is, but the general major, our allies in the world have said that there's certain ratios that we have to meet. The good news is we can get there. You can't get there tomorrow, but we have done this before. We've balanced our budget before, but what the Republicans have us in is a straitjacket, and this is a straitjacket. It's very simple. Grover Norquist has gotten all of them every single one except for a handful and mm -hmm. Aaron if you know who those are I'd like to give them a shout out because they are brave you know leaders but Grover Norquist has told them they can not raise a dime okay so when you can't raise any money you can't get there by cutting you know you've got to raise some revenue and cut and we have we can cut discretionary non-defense we can cut some defense not too much we most certainly can do some entitlement reform of Medicare Medicaid and Social Security I'm gonna say something that nobody's gonna believe but Bill will prove me correct Social Security has not contributed to our deficit to date we have to change it a little bit so it'll be sustainable but in fact besides China uh, Social Security has lent us more money than anybody mm -hmm. else except for China. Sure. Social Security's surplus is so great, has been so great over the last 20 years, that it actually lent its surplus to the general fund, and we then spent every penny. So Social Security and China have been helping the general fund of the United States, you know, try to operate. and. 
but in all fairness, what really caused the deficit, you know how the Republicans always say, oh, well, we were at $9 billion when George Bush left, and now we're at 15. Well, yes, the president, we had a stimulus, a modest stimulus of $800 million. We spent, a, you know, maybe up to about a trillion five compared to Bush's $5 trillion of extra spending. But what really put us in the hole was a recession. You know, revenues started falling off. It's just like if your business goes into a slow period, you were making 100000 a year, and then all of a sudden your revenues go down to 50000 Well, you still have the same expenses, but you have 50000 less dollars. It's kind of the same thing that happened to the federal government. So our deficits just exploded, not because the way you hear the Republicans say, Barack Obama is spending us into a socialist economy and expanding, you know, uh, entitlements. It's that the money just, I mean, the bottom just fell out. So the bottom line is, I think that we will avoid sequestration. I think we can get some version of Simpson Bowles, but the Republicans are going to have to change their tune about um, raising revenue. And the reason I know we have to raise revenue, and I'm not talking about you know, raising everyone's taxes, raising rates and being onerous. But you've got to figure out how to close loopholes, maybe raise some of the rates slightly on the higher income, over 350000 or 300000 in annual income, maybe even 500000 But you've got to do that because the income coming into the federal treasury, and this is, you know, people think this counterintuitive, but it's the right the truth, is only 17% of the GDP, Bill. It's the lowest since President Eisenhower was the president. So you've got less money coming in at r relative to the GDP. It's more dollars because we're a richer nation. But relative to the GDP, which is the only measure you can judge these things on over decades, but even in the face of that, when I even tell my friends, Bob Corker and you know, Lamar Alexander, you guys, you've got to put more money on the table. They're just have signed this pledge to Grover Norquist, and they won't. So my end of conclusion, my end of my little rant here is this. Alan Simpson, who we all have a lot of respect for, former Republican, said, quote, you can go on Google and find this out on the Internet. He said, why are my colleagues afraid? I'm going to paraphrase. He said, Grover Norquist can't burn down their house. <laughs> he can't take their children from them. He said all, all he can do is cause them to lose their next election. And if they care more about winning their next election than helping the country get back on fiscal, sound fiscal footing, they shouldn't be a member of Congress to begin with. And you know what? He's right. So that's what this, and I wish the president would vocalize this more. I mean, my only criticism of him is if he would explain this more, kind of like I am, not because I'm, you know, better than he is in a lot of ways, but I think some of us can explain this. People would be really riled up in the country and say, you know, the Republicans are really wrong and they're causing our country to be much weaker than we have to be. And it's not fair and it's not right. Um, so, but, but I think that message is coming across, I hope. And it offends me the hypocrisy of a lot of Republicans who, just to throw a word in here if I may. Go. Uh, who say, <laughs> You know, the president should have adopted Simpson Bowles, and why didn't he embrace Simpson Bowles? Simpson Bowles, in fact, raises revenue. I mean, which mm -hmm. Republicans refuse? So they they, they refuse they to do it. it on the one hand, but they refuse any opportunity they've been given to to consider any uh, increase they in revenue. Not. And of course, it's also true, which a lot of people, I, I think, mm. we and the president and all of us have to do a better job of saying that Simpson Bowles could not even get their okay. plan out of their own commission. One of the reasons is because Paul Ryan and all the Republicans yeah. voted against it. Yeah. Right? So yes. they're not the champions of Simpson Bowles that they pretend to be. You have uh, the filibuster count. Yes, here, here it is. I'll let you announce oh, it. Oh, you have. Well, you have your glasses on. I, can't, uh, I cannot read it, so I'm like, woo. Uh, yeah, it's been used more than 360 times since uh, May of 2007. As of this year, right. And so relative to past is what, Aaron? Do they have it? It's, it's, there's a graph that's just, yeah. yeah, it's a graph that just goes straight up. So, I mean, it's, it might be like 50 times in the you know, right. comparison, and now 360 times, like 50 times over the last 20 years, and 360 times in the last year. But also, yeah, and it's, it's been 
moved from a, a filibuster on the vote on the floor right. to filibuster the procedural vote as to whether even to move to, to take a vote. So it, it and it's total total abuse of that. Well, so Senator, I want to come back a, a little closer to home for you because we we still hear the word Katrina. Uh, you know what a body blow to your state and to the city. Have we recovered from Katrina, and what lessons were learned? And will and comp, kind of a compound. Will New Orleans ever be the same? <laughs> Well, I'll start with the last one first. New Orleans is going to be better than it ever was. Um, I can say that with some level of confidence. My brother is the mayor, <laughs> and uh, I know the work that he's doing very well. And uh, the whole city, he was elected overwhelmingly by every precinct in the city, every neighborhood, every racial group, and he still enjoys tremendous support because of his great leadership, of course, the council, and, and he's also leading a regional recovery. Um, but he's had plenty help, plenty help from this administration, from President Obama, unlike President Bush that was very reluctant. President Obama has leaned forward from the day that he stepped in. His cabinet members have been there nonstop. Literally, Janet Napolitano has been there 12 times, um, which is unprecedented. Um, Sean Donovan has been there at least 10 times. I mean, this is in four years. I mean, the, the cabinet officials just come in and out, helping in every way they can. But let me go to the first one. We're going to learn a lot about Katrina. There are going to be many books written about it because what I'll say in just the short snippet is the President of the United States, I'll never forgive him for it because he never really told the people of the country what actually happened. And what happened was Katrina did not knock the city to its knees. It was the day after Katrina. The sun was out. The city had survived a huge, monstrous Category 3 storm, and the region had survived. I mean, there was huge damage, of course, along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. That is not unusual. You know, if you live through Camille, you live through Betsy, you know, when a storm like that, 150 mile an hour winds, blows up against the beaches along the Gulf Coast, there's nothing you can do other than have stronger homes to withstand it. I mean, if Trent Lott's 6,000 square foot brick mansion, there was nothing left but the hose, would tell you how strong that wind is. But when you get off the beach and you get 75 miles, what used to be 75 miles of very lush, strong marshland, which is gone to New Orleans, you shouldn't have that kind of wind because it'll, you know, the, the marsh blocks the wind and the trees. But what happened wasn't the storm. It was the federal levee system that collapsed. In 52 places, there were breaches. And the water didn't come from the river, it came from the Gulf. And when it came, it didn't come in inches. Um, it, it came in feet, and it came 12 and 14 feet of water. The lake is 26 miles wide that sits, you know, eight parishes sit around Lake Pontchartrain. It, it, the Gulf, and it sits close to the Gulf. It's like a tidal lake that's connected to the Gulf. And when that mm -hmm. storm blew up, it emptied, and the, and the levees collapsed around the city, it emptied the lake into the city. And 80% of the neighborhoods on the East Bank were destroyed. So just think about Washington, D.C. This is the way I explain it to people here. Just let's say Anacostia was fine. Okay, no water on your west bank, that's what we would call it, about a third of the city. But on this bank, which we would say the east bank, but in Washington, every single neighborhood, including Capitol Hill, would be underwater by 14 feet of water. Wow. So the city went from 450,000 people, 475,000 people, down to about 30,000. And when George Bush did his press conference at, in the French Quarter to yeah. say with the lights on, remember that in front of the in front of cathedral, the cathedral, yeah, that New Orleans is open for business. I mean, it was just a complete fabrication, just a complete hoax. There was no electricity for miles around in any direction. They set up a generator and hooked that electricity up 
and claimed that the city was back. The only thing that was back was what never left was the French Quarter, because that was what the French and the Spanish built. And so that survived. It was what the Americans built, you know, that kind of ruined it after that. But from, from just, you know, you all have been to the French Quarter many times. It originally 10 blocks one way, 10 blocks square. That didn't get a drop of water. And then all along the river, which is in any community the highest part of the city, along the river, which is the ridge, we call it the Crescent Ridge, let's say for a quarter of a mile along the river, which is only a small fraction of the population. Poor people live on that ground and wealthy people live on that ground. That was another misnomer, that it was only the poor neighborhoods that flooded. There were million dollar homes that were under you know, 14 feet of water, which is another thing that people didn't realize. The entire lakefront was underwater. So here's a president who a city was co virtually completely destroyed. And he never really kept saying anything about it. He just no. kept blaming yeah. the governor and the mayor for not evacuating people. So the long and short of it is, thank goodness that I, I was here. I have to say it's going to be the legacy of my commitment and on the Appropriations Committee in the right spot at the right time and just my personality. I would just not let the president get away with it. So fought for billions and billions of dollars and got that money back to the city and to the region. So the levy system, the conclusion of this, the levy system that you all invested in, $14 billion, held in Isaac. In Isaac, In right. Isaac. There wasn't a drop of water in New Orleans, Jefferson for the most part, which is a $450,000 parish, 450,000 person parish, right on the other side of the canal that breached. And then St. Bernard, you know, St. Bernard lost, they had 67,000 people. So just think of a neighborhood. Capitol Hill, 67,000 people. I don't know how many people Capitol Hill has. Um, completely every home was destroyed and every home completely uninhabitable. It would take a long time to rebuild, right? So that's what we're on. Seven years out, we're rebuilding. We're back at about 350,000 people. Hmm. So we have about 100,000 people to go. Most of those people are kind of back home in Louisiana. They went to Houston, they went all over. They've come home getting as close as they can. Every week I run into someone when I'm home. Senator, I'm back, we're so happy. You know, the kids graduated from high school in Houston, but we're buying our house, we're coming back. People are trying to get back. But we have many lessons to learn. There'll be many books written about it, but you've got to start with leaders that tell the truth, first of all, about what happened and why it's important to save this place because it's important to the whole country. President Bush, we'll will be remember, I'm sorry. Yeah. President Bush will be remembered for saying New Orleans is back. He'll also be remembered for saying, Brownie, you've done a heck of a yeah, job. Yeah, heck of a job. Uh, is, uh, what, what about FEMA? Has FEMA <laughs> Much improved? better, much better. Craig Fugate is a tremendous leader, very knowledgeable. He came out of Florida. The President Obama did a great job of appointing people who actually know what to do, which makes a huge difference. It's uh, And Joe Lieberman and Susan Collins get a lot of credit for helping to reform FEMA. Susan was really leaning forward. Uh, she's the authorizer. I now am the appropriator for FEMA. I'm the chair of the Homeland Security Appropriations Committee. So I fund FEMA and the Coast Guard, which did a magnificent job rescuing people. But, you know, we lost 1,800 lives. I mean, if wow. you think about that, we lost 3,000 approximately in 9-11, lost 1,800 people. Half of them probably drowned and or some, something related to the water and half of them either um, died of a stroke, watching everything they own or you know died of a heart attack or died of exposure. I don't even think we've ever really published, think about that, I don't think the President of the United States ever even asked to publish the names of the victims. Mm. There's no monument that I know of. I just asked my staff the other day, we've got to really think about doing something for the names of yes, yes. the people that died in 2005, August 29th. 1,800 Americans lost their lives when the infrastructure of this country collapsed and some of them drowned in their own homes. I mean, it's really frightening to think about. And, and that's another thing that I think um, the president really did not tell people about the state of infrastructure. But, you know, we, li we all live and learn. I've learned a lot, and I think FEMA's much better. I don't think it'll happen again. But Isaac was a very bad storm, and there are plans for that I won't go into. But, but thank you all for everything you do. And people still come down, Bill. We just had yeah. 30,000 kids from the Lutheran Church. 30,000 huh. 
kids came down and they're still gutting homes and helping people get back. Brad Pitt's still there. Y'all got to come down and see Brad Pitt. <laughs> Our favorite New Orleanian. Yeah, when we were there, we saw some of the homes that he's actually, yeah. that, he's, that he's built. Well, a similar question. It's sort of like a double whammy, uh, recovering from Katrina. And then we had the BP oil spill a couple of years ago. Uh, the lessons learned from that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and, and is the golf back? The golf is back. The golf is back. You see the the wonderful commercials on television yeah. here. It really is not um, a hype, a hyperbole, a hyper a hyper about that. I mean, it's really true. Um, it's not an over exaggeration. It's really true. Um, I flew over the Gulf just last weekend, two weekends ago, with Ron White, and I took him down because he's going to be the president. He's going to be the chairman of the uh, Energy Committee in the Senate. And he had never seen the offshore rigs, and he'd never been to the uh, mouth of the Mississippi River, which is really an extraordinary trip yeah, if any yeah. of you ever get down there and can rent a little plane or a helicopter and get up in the air and fly out from the Superdome. We lifted off on a helicopter and flew right up and over. And you can see how the marsh has so deteriorated. You know, when our city was founded, there were just miles and miles and miles of cypress trees and things that protected the city. But the river has been um, levied for the channelization of this great navigation, the greatest, one of the greatest river systems in the world. And the subsidence is just frightening. So I showed him that. Um, and you know, he was very, 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 very <laughs> impressed with it. Mm -hmm. And you know, so we've just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other. And, and in terms of um, the deep water platforms and platforms, what happened with deep water horizon? Are well, they, they're all back. I mean, and, they're, and are they're, they they're coming to, back. They're much safer. You know, we would argue, and I'm a big supporter of the oil and gas industry. I know that there are some people that aren't, but the industry, for the most part, has had a very excellent record over time. And I'll give you some statistics before the BP. <laughs> which was horrific and a real outlier as these things go. We've been drilling in deep water for a long time now, not as long as shallow water, but in the last 20 years, we, we're now drilling easily 10, 20, 30,000 feet deep uh, wells, which is pretty extraordinary technology that allows you to do that. We developed that technology in the Gulf, and until BP, we'd never had a massive blowout. In fact, with all the wells we've drilled, over 40,000, we had less spillage from those platforms than from the natural spillage in the ocean itself, and most certainly a lot less than the tankers. I mean, the, the, the pollution comes when tankers run in, like Exxon Valdez was a tanker accident. We have tanker accidents a lot. Some of them get front page and some of them are buried on the back yeah. of the page. We don't really have tankers in the Gulf, you know. And if we do, they tie up 18 miles offshore. They don't try to come close to the shore. They tie up to a facility we call Loop, which I think there should be one everywhere so the tankers don't have to come into port. It's like a big hose. They, they put the hose together and then they bring their oil off the tankers by pipeline. That's how we do it in the Gulf. So BP, I think the company, you know, they're getting ready to go to trial. And they're going to pay either go to trial or there's going to be a settlement. And they're going to pay the biggest settlement, biggest penalty. And they deserve to pay a big penalty because they really, from everything I've read, from everything I hear, they were rushing that well. They had a lot of, uh, they just, they were not, they were just not minding the store. So 11 men were killed. Some men were injured. And they spilled 5 million barrels of oil in the Gulf. We think we've collected about four million. We've, we've lost a million. Nobody can account for it. The science is not where it needs to be. But we're going to take that BP penalty. This is a very important bill I passed with a lot of help. I'm very happy about it. The Restore Act, and instead of that penalty money coming to the federal treasury, I mean, we could use it for other things, of course. But we've diverted 80% of it to go back to the Gulf Coast to help in, in, do research about our oceans and our fisheries and also give the Gulf Coast states some direct revenue to shore up this coast, not only for our benefit, but for the benefit of the country. So we believe we can drill for oil and gas safely. BP, they were operating this well in a very reckless manner, and they've paid a tremendous uh, price because they've already paid out over $20 billion, and they may have to pay another $20 billion before the day's over. It's a lot of money. Yeah. But they yeah. but they messed up, and when you mess up something like that, you've got to spend money to clean it up. 
They're also spending a lot of money on television. They're also restoring. spending money on television, restoring yes. Their public image. We see those spots yeah. all the time, too. Uh, I have one more question, and then we'll open up to the floor here. Um, Senator, I want to ask you about the family business. I mean, you mentioned your brother, um, Mitch, uh, the mayor of New Orleans. Your great, your dad, great mayor of New Orleans, legendary, Moon Landrew. You, the United States Senator. I mean, so did your dad tell you and your brother, hey, this is the family, this is what we do, you got to run for office and get <laughs> no, involved no, in he politics? No, he didn't. He, he, make, he says often, you know, he's the father of nine children. My mother and father had nine of us, and they had us in 11 years. And, um, <laughs> and, and actually, four of us are in politics. I'm the senator, my brother's a mayor, my sister's an appellate court judge and had no opposition, thank you, when she ran. And then my brother right. is a U.S. attorney, unelected, but you could say political. So my father says at least he had five kids that were smart and, uh, <laughs> and didn't go into the business. But, um, but no, it's a tradition of public service. It's a tradition of public have. service. It started with him. You know, my father was the first uh, person in his family to go to college. His father went to third grade. His mother went to eighth grade. But they were a strong, uh, hardworking Catholic family that had two brothers. One brother had ten children, and my father had nine. Um, all of us have gone to college. Five of us have postgraduate degrees. My grandmother just worked her little fingers to the bone and sent my dad to Jesuit, and the Jesuits taught him. And my mother went to Ursuline, and the Ursuline nuns taught her. And then the nine of us just kind of grew up in this wonderful neighborhood, just like Capitol Hill, not quite as um, wealthy as Capitol Hill and in a much uh, uh, much more modest circumstance but um, very close-knit community and we were just sort of taught that you had to help out you know I mean kind of help out where you could and so that helping out and serving others and just kind of led and then I was very fortunate to marry this wonderful husband of mine whose uh, family was also in public service now people accuse me of a political uh, a marriage for com political advantage and I said yes that is true but I did love him as well um, because he was from a political and is from a political family not as large as mine but very well known from North Louisiana so for a girl from New Orleans to run statewide see I had to have this union uh, for North Louisiana so Frank served for 12 years his mother was one of the first women ever elected in Louisiana and served on the Bessie Board, which is like the elected Board of Elementary and Secondary Education in the largest congressional district. She was quite a character. She rode horses until she was 79. She bow raced and rode around a red pickup truck. And then Frank's dad never was elected, but he tried several times. <laughs> they were Republicans until the Civil Rights era, and then they switched um, you know, to be uh, stronger civil rights leaders. And anyway, so that's, it's been an interesting, but I, our family is just, we just believe in public service and uh, helping out where, where we can, and I'm happy that it ended up with me being in the United States Senate, well, we're and lucky. to be able to help you all as well when I can, and I'm very happy to have helped with this building. We're lucky you are where you are, and uh, both for the people of Louisiana and for us here on, on Capitol Hill. Uh, a question for Senator? Or, yeah. Your question, sure. Why don't you start us off? Uh, so I read that you were first elected to office at quite a young age. I was wondering if you'd be willing to reflect a little bit sure. on that and uh, what steps led you to be I think for the camera here, I should probably repeat the question. Is that yes. right? Uh, the question is, Senator, you were elected at a relatively young age. If, could you tell us about that, reflect on that a little bit, and how that all came about? It's a fun story. I was 23 when I was first elected to the House of Representatives. I'd only been out of LSU six months. <laughs> I graduated with a degree in sociology, very unsure about what I wanted to do. Went home to live with my parents. You know, my mother always said we could come home if we needed to. So I didn't have a job, so I went home, and my father said, you're not sitting around this house. Um, you know, I was very industrious as a kid. I've been working since I was 15. So he said, you're going to go out and get a job, or you're going to do something until you decide what you want to do. So I walked down the street in my neighborhood and went and volunteered for a friend of mine who lived around the corner who was running for judge. 
and started sweeping the floors and making coffee and then after a couple of weeks he decided he'd pay me a little bit so I did a you know kept doing whatever a lot of young people hanging out uh, behind a gas station on the corner of Broad and Washington right in my neighborhood and one thing led to another and lo and behold we won the race and we weren't supposed to because our candidate didn't have that much money or name recognition and the whole establishment was for someone else but we just worked our hearts out and so some of the labor leaders that were working in the campaign said you're very good at this how long have you been doing it and i said well since i've been five you know i was you know i was kind of doing this since i was five you know my mother literally used to walk pregnant and she, you know, who could tell a pregnant woman no in, in August? I mean, she's walking, she's hot. You know, Mitch, we tease him, he was campaigning since he was in utero. I mean, he was, my mom was campaigning for my dad when Mitch was, before he was born. So we, we, we say that he got it from the really early age. But, <laughs> but anyway, so I, I was just too young to know any different, I'll have to tell you. And I had been student body president in my high school, as silly as it sounds. I had gotten many leadership awards, so I thought, well, you know, I think I can do this. And I had been a telephone operator in the House of Representatives before we had cell phones. You know, when you called your representative in Baton Rouge, the telephone girls, because there weren't many boys, all girls, um, were answering the telephone, and so we would connect the senators. So I was so, you know, just so overly confident for my age. And I look back and I think I was really quite, you know, silly about some things. But I said, oh, well, I've listened to those debates. I'm most certainly sure that I can, you know, give my positions as well. And that's exactly how. And so that's how I ran. So I made my own signs, didn't even tell my dad. I literally hand painted my own signs, got all my friends to help. My mother's the best organizer the of free labor in the world, and I'm the second best organizer of free labor in the world. Yes, I ran against a 12-year incumbent. <laughs> I ran against uh, an attorney twice my age, a woman activist three times my age, and an environmentalist who was really one of the renowned environmentalists, and I beat them all in the first primary. Because I, what I did was I walked door to door for six months, six hours a day by myself, and then I went home and wrote a note to everyone I met, handwritten note to everyone I met. And so people would tell me by the time the race came, please don't come back to my house and I'll vote for you, you know? And said, don't, just don't come again. I'm not interested, you know, I'm too busy or whatever. So that's how, so I tell young people, you know, you can do it, don't be overwhelmed by it, but you have to get out and meet people and let them know why you're running. So that's how it started. Yeah, what a great story. <laughs> and Frank did the same. He. He walked door to door. In the uh, state when he was legislature, in his 20s, Frank as, Ewan. Which is like the county commissioner. Yeah. Well, Pierce, I think. And beat him. <laughs> Just outwork him, and they don't realize it. And, and people are so appreciative of you coming by. And, you know, people want to use phone banks and they want to do mail, but. I think that personal contact is very important with people, and people are shocked when they open the door and you're the candidate. They're like, oh my gosh, you came to my house? And I mean, I went to every house, twice. Mm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Very, very. Hi, yeah. Mary, yes? I'm curious, can you come up to the microphone so we can all hear you? I'm curious about um, uh, redistricting and and the effect that has on hyper-partisanship in the, in the Congress, mostly. I mean, Senate, everybody's running statewide, so it's they don't have that concerning. issue. It's very concerning. And it, it just, I, I don't, there's really no way to control redistricting from the federal level, because by definition, it's a local issue. But I wish that something could be done so that each person who was elected to Congress, no matter, to the House, no matter which party, um, would have had an, a race in which he or she um, had another uh, competitor who had a chance of winning. And therefore, they would have to have some lessons in reaching across the aisle, quote unquote, while they were running for office. Exactly. No, you have put your um, finger right on the problem, and you're absolutely correct. And I'm not sure what can be done about it, but we have to have, we should have a more detailed discussion, Bill. And I don't know if you have 
any thoughts about it, I'd appreciate hearing it, but you're absolutely correct because the states redistrict and that they do that. They redistrict so your district is highly, highly conservative Republican or it's highly, highly liberal. And so neither side has any reason to give anything to the other. Now when you're a senator, the reason that the Senate sometimes, even though the House keeps saying we can't pass anything, the fact of the matter is we can pass things that are bipartisan. Yes. They're the ones. They right. keep passing bills, but they're only drafted by Republicans, only passed by Republicans. Not one Democrat would put their name on it. Mm -hmm. Those bills have not a chance of passing through us, but we've sent many things over there that are reasonable, that both Democrats and, and Republicans, and they just won't even take it up because we have to be that way. In fact, my first district, going back to my 23-year-old, I had a district that was 50% white and 50% black, almost even. And it was very poor and as well, very wealthy. Like I had the poorest neighborhood in my district and the wealthiest, the Garden District, yeah, many of you know, yeah. and the St. Thomas Housing Project. Whoa. So, you know, one neighbor had, neighborhood had a net worth of an average of, you know, $3 million, and the next neighborhood had a negative net worth. That's what I had to represent. So from an early age, I was kind of pushed to try to find common ground. If there was any to be found, I was looking for it. And I was very fortunate to, to grow up in, in a family that was like that, in represented districts like that. But I come here and I listen to some of my colleagues and I think, what kind of place do they live? I mean, it's so one way or the other that you can't find any, you know, common ground. But you are absolutely correct. And Bill, I don't know what, what, have you talked with any of your colleagues about what could no, be done it, it about would, it? Or the problem is it would have to be done in at the state 50, level? At, at 50 different ways by 50 different states. I can just give you one uh, example for California, where we come from. And California has the largest congressional delegation, so it's like 55 or 53, whatever it is. And ironically, this was a, a classic case of bipartisan across the aisle cooperation in that before redistricting, the Republicans would sit down with the Democrats and, and they would say, we'll make a deal. We'll preserve, we'll protect all of your Republican seats if you let us protect all of our Democratic seats. And so you had like say, whatever the, the decision was, 35 safe Democratic seats and 20 safe whatever the Republicans would settle for. And that was not solving the problem. It was just compounding the problem. Compounding the problem. So what happened is last, the last election, California took redistricting away from the political parties and gave it to an independent commission of retired judges or something. Now this, is, this election is the first one we have under the new districts. They redrew the districts, by the way, and they are, some of them, t talk about gerrymandering, I mean impossible shapes and, and everything, but they're not done to protect the parties, and so you've got a chance this time to have a real shakeup in the congressional delegation in California. We'll just have to see how it works. But I think you have to get it, I say this as a, as a partisan Democrat, I think you have to get it away from the political parties. But you have to do it 50 times. You can't do it at the federal level, so. And I mean, I'll just add this. I mean, it's an interesting, but those of you here are for political junkies, but you know, in the South, it was done with the African-American and the Republican who came together. Because African-Americans, you can understand, wanted to have um, their repre representation because they'd been so underrepresented for so mm -hmm. many years. So what they did, and most African Americans in the South are Democratic, not all, but 95%. So they went to the Republicans and said, okay, we're gonna create a district that's 75% African American so that we can get elected. And there's argument. Look what Barack Obama's struggling with as the first black president, first African American president. He won, but it was a big lift. A lot of people in the South, a lot of my African American friends will tell you, I mean, one of my staffers ran for Congress. He said, you know, Mary, I know if I was white, I would have won, but I just couldn't win. And he's correct, unfortunately. There's still districts like that in the South. He's otherwise perfectly qualified and would absolutely have won, and it's just race. So the Black Caucus knew that. So that's what's happened in the South. It's not that it's become it's it's not as Republican as people think. It's just these districts are heavily African-American, and then when you take the African-Americans out of a district, it becomes 
more conservative than it would normally be. I don't know how to describe it. Right. So what's happening now is a lot of the black leaders are rethinking this and saying, okay, this was, you know, we wanted to do this, we did this, but the ramifications of it are very detrimental to all of the interests that we have. So there's a little bit of rethinking going on. You know, John Lewis would have a lot better perspective yeah. than I do, but, but that's kind of what happened in the South, uh, where the populations are 30% uh, African American in my state. Uh, it's, it's, yes, sir. You can ask you to get to the mic. Right. I, I was going to ask you about the filibuster, but actually yeah. I like this discussion. Uh, another thing in California is open primaries. Now, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on whether that could help alleviate some of the hyperpartisanship. I think it can. I've run under open primaries and closed primaries, and I'm happy to say I've won in every case, um, except for one for my governor's race, but I've won for the Senate. But my state keeps going back and forth. That's how, you know, we are one, four years were open, and then they close it, and then they open it. So I've won in both, but I prefer running in an open primary because I find that it does tend to not favor the wings of either party. Because in a primary, you've got to run so far to the right to get your party's vote. And then if you're a Democrat, you have to run so far to the left that sometimes the center, where a lot of people are right now, is left out. So California, didn't they just open their primary? Yes, yes. So it's going to mm -hmm. be interesting to see. Louisiana's had open primary for a long time. And then the two people have to run out off. So sometimes I've been in a runoff with a Republican. Sometimes I've been in a runoff with a Democrat, which is interesting, you know. So that way people have you got to vote for the person, not the party. I kind of like that, and I think it might help. Um, but I would appreciate some other view on it. But that would be my perspective. Now, there are several seats in California, most notably. Uh, two residents of the Hill, Howard Berman and Brad Sherman, who are running against each other because they were the two top vote getters in this new district. And they're both Democrats? Howard and yeah, Brad. Ed Brad. Yeah, both Democrats, right. Yeah. Uh, some of you may have seen the video that went viral of Brad Sherman threatening to punch Howard Berman out oh. uh, at a debate. I uh, thought yes, we just did that in Louisiana. Uh, two more questions. Go ahead. Okay, a couple more. Yes, ma'am. And then, yeah. Hi, Senator Landrieu, and I'm going to meet you. My name is Courtney Anderson. I'm a native of New Orleans, Louisiana. Oh, okay, cool. All I've right. been in D.C. for eight years. What was your neighborhood, years. Courtney? Uptown New Orleans. I went to Audubon Montessori yeah. and Benjamin Franklin Love High School. Yeah. Um, so my question is kind of related to what we've been discussing. What do you think about the current political landscape in Louisiana? Mm -hmm. Well, at the state level, it's pretty bleak from our perspective. You know, we have um, uh, Governor Jindal, who is our governor, and... Um, while we've worked together in some ways on education reform and, uh, and uh, some other things, he's one of the, the only governor in the state to turn back um, an $80 million broadband initiative, the only governor in the whole country, not in the state, the only governor we got uh, secured with the help of this administration, $80 million to get rural communities connected to the high-speed Internet, and he sent the money back because he said he didn't want to have federal funds coming into the state. He's only one of three governors, but then he took the stimulus money <laughs> and went around and cut ribbons, you know, claiming that it was partly his. Mm -hmm. um, he, he's one of three governors that has refused to expand um, Medicaid, even though Louisiana has more people uninsured. If he would accept this tomorrow, 550,000 people could get health care that they don't Whoa. have today. 550,000 people. And these are people, 275,000 of them are working. They're working in hotels or restaurants where they work a full, but they only make $28,000 a year or $30,000. You don't have health insurance, so you know Medicaid would cover you up to 133% of poverty. So, you know, and he has, um, not raised a dime, signed the Grover Norquist Pledge, so our hospitals are getting cut and closed, both in poor and wealthy communities. People are pretty much in an uproar about it. Our universities are taking a big hit, and he's just not, uh, his whole shtick is, um, I don't, I'll have a quote, surplus, will not raise a dime, took the Grover Norquist, Norquist Pledge, and um, as a result, our state's really floundering, but so are his poll numbers that have dropped. <laughs> 12 points in the last year. 
and so while he would probably you know and I'm not sure he would win again if he ran mm -hmm. so it's Republican he just got reelected though so it's Republican primarily but it's starting to change and I'm up in two years then we're gonna try to elect a Democratic governor we have some fabulous Democratic mayors in Shreveport, Cedric Glover, of course, Kip Holden in Baton Rouge, African-American and white Hispanic mayors of some of our cities. So it's, it's kind of bleak, and, but the governor's getting pretty beat up about traveling the country for Romney and not paying attention to business at home. Mm -hmm. So I think there's hope for the Democratic Party resurgence. So we have time for two more, and I see you, you sir, and then the gentleman in back of you. Yeah. Now, um, this gentleman here first? Yeah, I think What's he's been your waiting. What's your outlook for implementing um, uh, the Affordable Care Act? Well, as I said, um, you know, in our state, the governor has refused to set up the exchanges. He's refused, um, which will be done anyway, because thank goodness we put in the law. You meant on the national level, didn't you, in terms of, okay. right? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. what I'm, I'm going to say, so the governor, I mean, how, we're going to try to implement the law, but part of it has to be implemented by governors. So if you're in a state... Right where the governor is helping you implement it, it's gonna get implemented faster. But I think that when President Obama wins, it'll be a step by step and this new process, uh, which is a way to cover everyone in the United States, the older people will be covered by Medicare, the poor people will be covered by Medicaid, and everybody in the middle will be basically covered through a private coverage which is a Republican idea. Yeah, that's right. It came out of the Heritage Foundation. You know, it came out of the Heritage Yeah, the Heritage Foundation. Yeah, the Heritage yeah. Foundation came up with this. Instead of having a single-payer system like Canada or a government-run system, this is truly a public-private partnership, which with everybody paying kind of according to their means, which makes sense, and if you're very wealthy, you pay everything for your own insurance. But if you're not, even up to 400% of poverty, which goes almost to like $95,000, almost up to $100,000 of income in some states, you can get a little bit of a subsidy to buy the kind of insurance you want for you, chosen by you, from an exchange that might have 30 plans. This is a very pro-choice, you know, choice, consumer-oriented, private sector model that they're now railing against but that's what it is. So I think we're going to implement it. If Romney is elected, there are going to be some of us that will um, that are going to hold the line and not have it repealed. I'll be one of them. I may lose my seat over it, but I'm prepared to do it. So it just will depend on how, um, you know, it will just depend on how many of us are there to, to hold it. Yes, sir. You can wrap it up tonight then. Hey, thank sure. You. Yeah, my name is Ed Dooley. I'm a neighbor here, and I just wanted to thank you for the wonderful assistance in thank saving you. this place. Uh, it's a good example of, of infrastructure. Yeah. You know, you, you put a lot of people to work during a really tough time, and uh, it, it is hopefully what could happen after the election if you on appropriations and the Ways and Means Committee mm -hmm. can get together and, and do what the president suggested, that maybe um, the, the, the lack of spending or the reduced spending because of uh, Iraq and uh, and Afghanistan over the next few years will allow us to have some money to do infrastructure things like building marshes uh, to protect New Orleans and, yes. and to do uh, uh, infrastructure that will put people to work and, and provide benefit to the to the United States. Absolutely, it's a the perfect, whole question yeah. of infrastructure, yeah. Senator, is one that that. Maybe people don't understand, but it's pretty basic, taking mm -hmm. care of our roads and our bridges and our highways. And, and, and used rail, to be roads, something bridges, that- And bridges, rail, and may I say water. I mean, which water. is a big issue for us in Louisiana that gets overlooked. I mean, we cannot put any more 18-wheelers on our highways, can we? I mean, we if you go down these highways and you see these 18-wheelers, and with the trade and expanded trade, which we're all for, and the great opportunities with the internet and with global expansion and exports, We've got to start using our waterways better. And we, you should have someone come and talk about that uh, because it's a very interesting subject. We have kind of sure. forgotten about our rivers, our canals, our waterways, and it, you can move things very, very cost efficiently on the water, get them off of our highways. And also, we're developing natural gas um, engines and running our engines not on the dirty diesel anymore so you can kind of clean up the atmosphere, clean up your waterways, get the trucks off the highways, use your waterway system, and you're right, putting our people at home uh, back to work. So 
Thank you all. Senator, it's so great to visit you tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, folks. Thank you.